नमस्कार डियर स्टूडेंट्स इन दिस लेसन वी शैल ट्राई टू अंडरस्टैंड द कॉन्सेप्ट ऑफ कंज्यूमर डिफेक्ट इन गुड्स एंड डेफिशियंस इन सर्विसेस मोस्ट ऑफ द कंज्यूमर्स सफर फ्रॉम डिफेक्ट इन द गुड्स परचेज बाय देम आर द डेफिशियंसी इन सर्विसेस हाइड बाय देम इन ऑर्डर टू प्रोटेक्ट the rights of consumers we need to understand the meaning and scope of the definition of consumer defect in goods and deficiency in services the objectives of this lesson are to understand the meaning of consumer to analyze the definition of goods and services to know the meaning of defect in goods with suitable case laws and illustrations to appreciate the meaning of deficiency in services with suitable case laws and illustrations and to compare the position under the consumer protection acts of 1986 and 2019 mm-hmm. let's try to understand the concept of goods first we cannot survive in this world unless we use goods articles and products in our daily life thus purchase of goods becomes inevitable from an economic perspective goods are items that add some kind of benefit to the lives of people who consume them most companies make and sell goods whether they are physical products or services that consumers can regularly use the old consumer law in india that is the consumer protection act of 1986 defined goods as defined in the sale of goods act 1930 under section 2 clause 7 of that act goods means every kind of movable property other than actionable claims and money and includes stock and shares growing crops grass and things attached to or forming part of the land which are agreed to be severed before sale or under the contract of sale section 2 clause 21 of the new consumer protection law that is the consumer protection act 2019 has in a way simplified and also updated the definition as under goods means every kind of mobile property and includes food as defined in clause j of subsection 1 of section 3 of the food safety and standards act 2006 the food safety and standards act under section 2 clause 1 sub clause j defines food as any substance whether processed or unprocessed genetically modified or engineered food infant food packaged drinking water alcoholic drink chewing gum and any substance including water used into the food during its manufacture preparation or treatment which is intended for human consumption it may be noted that this act also defines product for the purpose of product liability and under section 2 clause 33 it means any article or goods or substance or raw material or any extended cycle of such product which may be in gaseous liquid or solid state in other words product includes goods also section 2 clause 43 of the new act defines spurious goods meaning such goods which are falsely claimed to be genuine supply of such goods attracts not only the remedy under the consumer law but also action under other relevant statutes including penalties the constitution of india in its dictionary clause 
that is article 366 defines goods as including all materials, commodities and articles. An analysis of the above definitions given under different laws shows that goods are all kinds of mobile properties consumed by human beings. Now let us understand the meaning of defect in goods. It may be noted that the consumer laws in India have not defined the expression defect in goods. They define the expression defect only. The old act defined under section 2 clause 1 sub clause f the defect as meaning any fault, imperfection or shortcoming in the quality, quantity, purity or standard which is required to be maintained by or under any law for the time being in force or under any contract express or implied or as is claimed by the trader in any manner whatsoever in relation to any goods. The new act defined it almost similarly except adding the words and the expression defective shall be construed accordingly, thus taking care of defective goods under the act. The defect in any goods can be determined with reference to the facts and circumstances of the case. Whenever the goods purchased are of inferior quality or insufficient quantity or impure or substandard, the consumer can approach the appropriate consumer commission seeking a relief. The principle of caveat emptor that is buyer beware is no more available to the sellers of goods. Now let us come to services. The consumers avail different kinds of services in their day to day life. The good old days practice of human beings taking care of their needs on their own appear to have disappeared now. When banking, insurance, electricity, medical and the like services are availed, there would be scope for deficiency in providing such services either by individuals or corporates. The 1986 act defined the expression service in an inclusive manner as under. Service means service of any description which is made available to potential users and includes but not limited to the provision of facilities in connection with banking, financing, insurance, transport, processing, supply of electrical or other energy, border lodging or both, housing construction, entertainment, amusement or the purveying of news or other information, but does not include the rendering of any service free of charge are under a contract of personal service. The new act defines it in the same terms under section 2 clause 42. The definition is not exhaustive as both the acts used the expression includes but not limited to. An analysis of this definition shows that service may be of any description including those mentioned in the definition. It may be existing or future service. It does not include gratuitous service that is which is rendered free of charge. It does not cover service under a contract of personal service that is services rendered under an employer employee relationship. Now, Coming to the deficiency in service, the consumer laws in India have given a comprehensive definition 
of the expression deficiency. Section 21G of the old act defined deficiency as any fault, imperfection, shortcoming or inadequacy in the quality, nature and manner of performance which is required to be maintained by or under any law for the time being in force or has been undertaken to be performed by a person in pursuance of a contract or otherwise in relation to any service. Section 2 clause 11 of the new act while retaining the definition under the old law added any act of negligence or omission or commission by such person which causes loss or injury to the consumer and deliberate withholding of relevant information by such person to the consumer. A comparison between both the definitions shows that the new definition is broader as it brings within the ambit of deficiency any acts of negligence or omissions or commissions causing loss or injury to the consumer. And quite interestingly, intentional withholding of relevant information from the consumer. Thus, even not providing the relevant and necessary information to the consumer also would be a deficiency. A logical interpretation of this definition also makes the service provider giving inadequate or inaccessible or illegible information and also is liable for deficiency in relation to the given service. The most important question under the Consumer Protection Act in case of defect in goods or deficiency in services is to identify the person who is the consumer. All the consumers in the literal sense may not be entitled to the relief under the consumer laws. The general meaning of consumer is the one who consumes in the capacity of purchaser of goods or hirer of services. However, every such purchaser or hirer will not become a consumer under the Acts of 1986 and 2019. Under Section 2, Clause 1, Subclause D of the 1986 Act, consumer means any person who buys any goods for consideration which has been paid or promised or partly paid and partly promised are under any system of payment, but does not include a person who obtains such goods for resale or for any commercial purpose or hires or avails of any services for a consideration which has been paid or promised are partly paid and partly promised are under any system of payment, but does not include a person who avails of such services for any commercial purposes. For this purpose, commercial purpose does not include use by a person of the goods bought and used by him and services availed by him exclusively for the purpose of earning his livelihood by means of self-employment. Under Section 2, Clause 7 of the new Act, which defines consumer on the same lines as the old Act, an addition is included in the context of the buyers and hirers of services not only offline but also online and also through multi-level marketing. This is a welcome improvement as most of the consumer transactions are taking place in recent times online using e-commerce platforms. It is pertinent to note that 
the consumer protection e-commerce rules 2020 framed under the new act of 2019 apply to all goods and services bought or sold over digital or electronic network including digital products all models of e-commerce including marketplace and inventory models of e-commerce all e-commerce retail including multi-channel single brand retailers and single brand retailers in single or multiple formats and all forms of unfair trade practices across all models of e-commerce. In fact, this definition classifies the consumers into two categories. First, consumer of goods. They are the first category of consumers within the definition. A person claiming as a consumer should satisfy the following conditions. There must be a sale transaction between the seller and the buyer. It must be of goods. It must be for a consideration. It must have been paid or promised or partly paid and promptly promised or under any system of deferred payment. And the user may also be a consumer when such use is made with the approval of the original buyer. Commercial purpose is a term of significance here. The term consumer does not include a person who obtains such goods for resale or for any commercial purpose. It is pertinent to note that the act has not defined the expression commercial purpose. Here it probably means a purpose of large scale profit making activity. Thus, it becomes clear that the parliament intended to restrict the benefits of the act only to ordinary consumers purchasing goods either for their own consumption or even for use in some small venture in order to make a living different from large scale manufacturing or processing activity carried in for profit. For instance, a person purchasing an auto rickshaw for running it for hire to earn livelihood is a consumer. The explanation added subsequently to the definition made it amply clear that commercial purpose does not include use by a consumer of goods bought and used by him exclusively for the purpose of earning his livelihood by means of self-employment. This explanation appears to have been inserted with a view to safeguard the interest of small consumers buying goods for self-employment to earn their livelihood. In a way, the explanation provides exception to an exception. Examples include when a jeep is purchased by the proprietor to be driven by the driver for transportation of passengers for hire, it can be said to have been purchased for a commercial purpose. On the other hand, if the buyer of the jeep himself wants to ply the jeep for transportation purposes to earn his livelihood, it would not be for commercial purpose. Where a charitable trust purchased a CT scan machinery and charged every patient referred to the diagnostic center and further only 10 percent of the patients were provided free service, it would be for a commercial purpose. The courts held that whether a complaint is using the goods exclusively by himself or the member of his family or whether he is employed any workman and if so how many are matter of evidence and that the burden is always on the person who claims the status of the consumer to prove them. If the complainant has no profile of a true consumer and is a seller of goods, he cannot maintain a complaint under the act as the act does not provide a platform to agitate for redressal to the seller of goods. The second category of consumers come within the meaning of consumer of services. 
in order to be considered as a consumer under the act for the purpose of services it is essential that the services must have been hired or availed of for consideration however such consideration may not be paid immediately under section 2 clause 1 sub clause d of the act a consumer for the purpose of services means any person who hires or avails of any services for consideration and includes any beneficiary of services other than the hirers or users provided that such services are availed of with the approval of the hirer therefore even a beneficiary of services is also considered as a consumer for the purpose of the act for example a beneficiary is a nominee under an insurance policy or under a bank guarantee services for commercial purposes are excluded under the act a clear analysis of the changes made by the 2002 amendment to the 1986 act shows that the definition of consumer does not include any person who avails a service for any commercial purpose following are few instances of commercial purpose purchase of vcr for running a video parlor purchase of ultrasound scanner machine purchase of photocopier for commercial purpose however the explanation to the relevant provision as changed by the 2002 amendment makes it clear that commercial purpose does not include used by a person not only of goods bought and used by him but also services availed by him exclusively for the purpose of earning livelihood by means of self employment in shiv shankar lal gupta versus kotak mahindra bank limited decided in the year 2013 the national commission categorically held that the consumer fora under the act of 1986 would not have jurisdiction in case of any alleged deficiency in banking service if the loan is obtained for commercial purpose and particularly when the matter is pending before the tribunal under the surface act 2002 similarly persons presenting documents for registration do not become consumers there is no element of commercialism involved in the whole process of registration of instruments or payment of stamp duty and the executant of an instrument at the time of its presentation for registration does not become a consumer nor do the officers appointed to implement the provisions of the registration act and the stamp act render any service within the meaning of consumer protection law in indian medical association versus vp shanta a landmark decision decided by the supreme court in 1995 the supreme court included the following categories of doctors and hospitals under the umbrella of consumer protection all medical and dental practitioners doing independent medical or dental practice unless rendering only free service all hospitals having free as well as paying patients and all the paying free category patients receiving treatment in such hospitals medical and dental practitioners and hospitals paid by an insurance firm for the treatment of a client or an employment for that of an employee in may 2019 in the highest compensation ordered for medical negligence in india the central drug standard control organization directed johnson and johnson private limited to pay over rupees 1 crore and 90 lakh respectively to two patients who suffered from faulty hip implants made by the company the indian government took cognizance of this issue and in february 2017 the health ministry set up a 11 member committee following a spate of complaints 
that were filed against Johnson and Johnson's metal on metal articular surface replacement hip implant devices XL acetabular hip system and hip resurfacing system. One year later in February 2018 the committee submitted its report which said that specialists must assess cases individually and compensation of at least rupees 20 lakhs must be given. Even a legal heir or representative of the deceased consumer would be a complainant under the act according to the principle stated in the case of Spring Meadows Hospital versus H. Aluvalia in the year 1998. Now let us look at the difference between deficiency in service and negligence. The Supreme Court in Ranveer Singh Bagga versus KLM Royal Dutch Airlines decided in the year 2000 explained the distinction between a deficiency in service and negligence as under. The deficiency in service cannot be alleged without attributing fault imperfection, shortcoming or inadequacy in the quality, nature and manner of performance which is required to be performed by a person in pursuance of a contract or otherwise in relation to any service. The burden of proving the deficiency in service is upon the person who alleges it. The deficiency in service has to be distinguished from the tortuous acts of respondent. In the absence of deficiency in service, the aggrieved person may have a remedy under the common law to file a suit for damages but cannot insist for grant of relief under the act for the alleged acts of commission and omission attributable to the respondent which otherwise do not amount to deficiency in service. The rendering of different service has to be considered and decided in each case according to the facts of the, that case for which no hard and fast rule can be laid down. Inefficiency, lack of due care, absence of bona fide, rashness, haste or omission and the like may be the factors to ascertain the deficiency in rendering the service. Dear students, we have tried to understand the meaning of consumer, goods, services, the concept of defect in goods and deficiency in services in this lesson. We try to understand the inclusions as well as exclusions from the above in the light of the new law of 2019. It is hoped that you have understood the same without any difficulty. Thank you.